This podcast is made possible by our supporters on Patreon, who pledge an amount to contribute every month and in return get exclusive access to bonus content, merchandise discounts, and much more. If you'd like to join our family, please go to patreon.com slash Gotham Variety and subscribe. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N slash Gotham Variety. We are joined this week on Gotham Variety by a special guest, Jonathan Eig, author of the best-selling biography, Ali, A Life, which the Washington Post called the first comprehensive biography worthy of this titanic figure. He has also written best-selling biographies of Lou Gehrig and Jackie Robinson. Jonathan, it's great to have you on the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. So before we make our way through Muhammad Ali's incredibly eventful life, what drew you to Ali as a subject? And also, since he was a more recent subject than either Gehrig or Robinson in terms of lifespan, how would you compare the research process on this biography to the other two? Well, what drew me to it was that I loved Ali as a kid. I was born in 64, so by the time I was, you know, really uh, old enough to watch uh, some of those fights, he was in the the latter stage of his career. But I certainly remember some of the the Frazier fights. I remember the rumble in the jungle. And, you know, he was just this enormous figure. He was was bigger than than any sports figure by far. Uh, Those fights were were bigger than the Super Bowl, bigger than 10 Super Bowls. Um, and when it occurred to me that nobody had yet done a proper biography, I was stunned. It just seemed like such an amazing opportunity um, because, you know, it had been enough time. By the time I started looking at this, it was 50 years from the point at which he became heavyweight champ, 50 years from the point at which he became um, a member of the Nation of Islam and refused to fight in Vietnam. You can put all that stuff in historical context now. But at the same time, tons of people were still alive uh, who knew him. Ali was still alive. So it was really the sweet spot for writing this book. And and that leads me to the second half of your question. Um, my other books, I had a few people around to talk to. I, I think I found 30 people who knew Gehrig or had, had played with him. For Jackie Robinson, I had Rachel Robinson to help me. But um, this book, I had by far the most access to people who were close to Ali. I did something like five or 600 interviews for this book, including three out of his four wives, uh, many of the people he fought, people who knew him really intimately. And that made all the difference because I was able to go out and and interview these people in person and um, provide a a kind of of reporting that that I love to do. But I didn't get a chance to do too much of on the other books. So Ali, born in 1942 as Cassius Clay, grew up in segregated Louisville, Kentucky, in modest circumstances, but not the kind of grinding poverty that future opponents like Sonny Liston, Floyd Patterson, and Joe Frazier experienced. His relationship with his father, also named Cassius Clay, was sort of a mixed bag. Uh, Talk about that relationship, if you would, and how it impacted Ali's early development. Yeah, I think that relationship with his father is, if you have to pick one key relationship in his life, that might be it. You know, as you said, most boxers um, come out of poverty. Ali did not. He was came from a middle class, lower middle class, but still middle class home, middle class neighborhood. His father was a sign painter. His mother was a domestic worker, c- cooking and cleaning for white families. But Cassius Clay Sr. was a very complicated figure. He was a race man. He subscribed to the ideas of Marcus Garvey that black people were never going to get a fair shake in this country. The only way for them to gain equality would be to leave. And uh, he was also a drunk and a womanizer. And he, he, he beat his wife and beat Ali at least once that we know of. But certainly, um, you know, Ali grew up in an abusive household. And um, under the thumb of this very charismatic, very uh, likable popular, but also drunk and dangerous man. Now, one of many things I learned from your book is that Ali's exposure to the Nation of Islam occurred much earlier than I thought uh, during a trip to the Golden Gloves tournament in Chicago in 1959, when he was just 17, from which he returned to Louisville with a certain recording. Talk about that initial exposure, if you would, uh, which his parents were less than thrilled about. Right. Ali you know, started traveling for the Golden Gloves. And, and when you travel, you know, whole new worlds open up to you, especially when you get a chance to leave the South and visit the North, where 
there's still a lot of racism in Chicago um, when he visits, but it's different. You know, black people don't have to get off the sidewalk when they see a white person coming. And um, members of the Nation of Islam are, are out on the streets uh, preaching and, and selling newspapers. And Ali encounters this. And, he, and as you mentioned, he brings home a record and, uh, that was recorded by a guy named Louis X, who would later become Louis Farrakhan. And it was a song called The, the White Man's Heaven is the Black Man's Hell. And it basically preached some of the things that Ali would would end up reciting over and over again over the course of the next you know 10, 20 years of his life, that this world was stacked in favor of the, the, the white man. The system was rigged and that black people were getting the raw deal. So after winning the gold medal at the 1960 Olympics in Rome, Ali acquired uh, financial backing from a group of wealthy white men in Louisville, took on Angelo Dundee as a manager, and pretty much tore through the ranks of the lesser heavyweights. But even at this stage, he was starting to master branding and self-promotion. And he had one impactful meeting with famous wrestler Gorgeous George in 1961. Talk about that meeting and Ali's developing and really revolutionary approach to self-promotion. Ali had a great knack for self-promotion, even as a kid. You know, when he would fight in these amateur bouts just in Louisville, he would walk around knocking on doors, telling people to watch him fight. And he would taunt his opponents, even in high school, in these amateur fights. He'd, he'd go into the locker room and taunt the guy he was going to fight just to try to get a rise out of him. But also, I think, because he knew it was, it was, it was fun. It was entertaining. And he was always sort of a class clown, uh, in part because he struggled with school and he found out later he was dyslexic. But he had this enormous appetite for attention. And when he began boxing professionally and thinking about his career, uh, he found that was very good for him because people would pay to see him fight uh, because he had a reputation for being a loudmouth. And when he encountered uh, Gorgeous George, the professional wrestler, it just set off all of these these bells in his head like, oh, my God, this is genius. Because it, it, Gorgeous George would, would intentionally make himself the bad guy, intentionally infuriate the crowds by you know, dressing as a woman and wearing curlers in his hair and spraying perfume. And it was such a... Um, a great draw. Everybody wanted to see him get crushed. And Ali thought, wow, if this works for a white guy, imagine how great it'll be if a black guy does it. They're going to really hate me. And he immediately began incorporating some of Gorgeous George's shtick. So Ali's poetry, uh, most of which, as you point out, was not written by him. Uh, the predictions of the round in which he would knock out his opponent, the relentless uh, self-admiration referring to himself in the third person, all elements of the Ali persona from the very beginning that were both groundbreaking and influential. But how much did these elements turn the press, and in many cases the boxing public at that time, against him? Because one thing that struck me as I reviewed his early fights is how much he was booed, even before his public conversion to Islam and his draft resistance. Right. He was booed and he was seen as a as a as a brat, a sore sport. Um, you know, sportsmanship was still was still a big deal back in those days. You were supposed to respect your opponent and you weren't supposed to gloat. And this was all especially true for a black athlete. You know, think about how um, Joe Lewis had to control himself, wasn't even allowed to raise his hands in the air after he knocked out a white opponent. He had to show humility. So along comes this kid who's cocky and calling himself the greatest when he hasn't won anything yet, taunting his opponents and predicting what round he's going to he's going to win. It all struck the uh, especially the older white reporters as uh, being in poor taste. So even before it becomes um, a racial thing, and even before he, he acknowledges his interest in the Nation of Islam, the reporters are coming down pretty hard on him. Of course, they're also loving the fact that he's revitalized the boxing world and that there's actually some interest in boxing again, which, you know, the sport had been fading until Ali came along. Exactly. So in February of 1964, Ali won the title, beating the fearsome Sonny Liston, whom he beat again in 1965. Now, there have been conspiracy theories galore on both of those fights with Liston, uh, both ending in knockouts. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But when it comes to boxing, nothing should be off the table. And after reviewing both fights, the second one does look fishy to me. Uh, the quote-unquote knockout punch looks very weak, and Liston's sort of rolling around on the canvas looks to me like a performance. But do you think that these were both legitimate victories, or do you suspect that Liston took a dive in at least the second fight? And if so, why would he do that? Great question, and I, I don't know that we'll ever have an answer 
I suspect that the first fight was a legitimate victory. Liston thought he was going to knock this kid out in the first round, and when he didn't, he got frustrated, and he knew he couldn't win. He, he, he gave up. Um, that's a little suspicious because, you know, he's a knockout puncher. He, he should have gone on and hoped that one big punch would at least give him a chance to, to salvage the fight, but I think the first fight probably wasn't fixed. The second fight looks a little fishy. As you said, the punch wasn't much of a punch that knocked Liston down, and then he's he's rolling around on the ground like – you know, a bad high school actor, and then he gets up and and tries to fight again after the after the ref has has whistled the fight over. It's it's all just a mess. Um, why would he get in there and throw the fight? Money, obviously, is always the easy answer, and it it could be that he was paid to throw the fight, but it's, it's hard to figure, and I don't think we're ever going to really know. Well, another theory was that Liston was afraid of reprisals from the Nation of Islam if he won. Right, he could have been intimidated, uh, frightened from the Nation of Islam, but if that's the case, then. I would just say don't show up for the fight, right? Um, maybe if he didn't show up, he wouldn't have gotten paid. Who knows? There were there were so many different theories going around at the time. It's fascinating and it's it's fun to speculate, but we're never going to know. Yeah. So Ali's brief relationship with Malcolm X was pivotal and his abrupt termination of that friendship prior to Malcolm's assassination in 1965 is one of the less attractive episodes you relate when it comes to Ali. But talk about the evolution of that relationship and also how that assassination affected Ali's mindset in relation to the Nation of Islam going forward. Ali loved Malcolm and Malcolm was really the charismatic force in the Nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad was the father figure, and he was the the leader of the religion. But Malcolm X was the, the the most charismatic, the most dynamic, the most exciting young minister that they had. And you can see so much of Ali's personality emerge through Malcolm X. Malcolm teaches him to be bold, to be proud of his color, to be proud of his of his heritage. And Ali really begins to mimic a lot of Malcolm X's language, and the, the notion that we're not going to play by the rules of American society integration isn't going to work. Why should we pretend it's going to work? They create this whole separate culture in the Nation of Islam that, that's very appealing to Ali and his sense of, of discipline and his sense of um, refusing to go with the crowd. But then when Malcolm has this falling out with Elijah Muhammad, Ali has to choose. And it was really, I think, a very painful decision for him, You know, whether to choose the father figure or the brother figure. And he, he chose Elijah Muhammad. He abandoned Malcolm X. And Malcolm X was assassinated soon after. One might argue that if Ali had um, had gone with Malcolm, that he could have saved Malcolm's life. Um, or if, if Ali had, had at least stood up to Elijah Muhammad and, and, and insisted that nothing should happen to Malcolm, that he could have saved his life. But Ali, in fact, mocked Malcolm X after after parting ways with him and said he got whatever he deserved if uh, if he crossed Elijah Muhammad. And I think that Ali, you know, regretted that for many, many years. I think he um, he had to live with the the pain of knowing that he had turned his back on a friend. And there's at least one quote in your book which indicates that part of Ali's reluctance to part ways with or criticize the Nation of Islam was motivated by fear that that assassination was a kind of object lesson. I think everybody was afraid to cross Elijah Muhammad, and um, Ali said it as much to one reporter. He said. You know, he was worried he'd end up dead if he if he ever crossed Elijah Muhammad. And that certainly um, could have played a role in his decision. All right. So despite his enormous charm and love of people in general, a troubling aspect of Ali is his verbal uh, degradation of his black opponents. It's interesting. He, he was much easier on his white opponents, but he called both Floyd Patterson and Ernie Terrell, Uncle Tom's, uh, said that only Alabama sheriffs, Klan members, and possibly Richard Nixon would root for Joe Frazier. He described George Foreman as representing the oppression of black people. And this is so absurd, it's, it's almost funny that, you know, since Ali fought Foreman in Zaire, and since Belgians were hated there, uh, that country used to be the Belgian Congo, Ali said that Foreman was Belgian. I mean, did Ali believe any of this or was he just psyching out his opponents and building the gate? And also, what was the impact on these fighters, pretty much all of whom, as we said, came from worse circumstances than he did and suffered the exact same prejudice? Yeah, I don't know that Ali really meant it. I think he um, was doing it in part to psych them out, but I think there was something else deeper going on there too. One of Ali's, one of the trainers who one of the old guys who've just been around boxing forever and knew all of these folks thought that Ali was really doing this out of insecurity, that these guys were tough ghetto kids 
they had real street cred. They were really tough. They'd come out of poverty. And Ali felt like he he didn't have that credential. He was a middle class kid. He, you know, had a fancy bicycle and a scooter growing up. And his, um, you know, he maybe was calling these guys names out of insecurity that he he felt like he didn't really belong in that crowd. He wasn't tough enough to hang with these guys. So he so he turned it around on them and pretended they were the Uncle Toms that they were the representatives of white America. And it was, you know, may have been an an immature and insecure thing to do, but it had real consequences. It it hurt these people's feelings. It wasn't just, even if Ali had had meant it to get under their skin and to to give them an advantage in the ring, it came to a point where it was, it was just too cruel. And, and for a guy who had that kind of respect um, in the black community to use that, a guy who was always talking about black power and, and black beauty and pride to, to demean so cruelly his fellow black uh, boxers, you know, somebody should have told him to cut it out. That he was, and maybe if he'd still been friends with Malcolm X, Malcolm would have said, you know, cut it out. Let's stick together here. So Ali, who, as you said, was dyslexic and a very poor student, failed his pre induction mental exam in 1964 and was exempted from military service. This was just before the really big escalation in Vietnam. But in February of 1966, the draft board in Louisville reversed its position and classified him 1A, making him eligible. What were you able to discover about this reversal? Was he being targeted by the government? And also, what were the primary factors that drove his draft resistance? Well, I think he probably was being targeted. I think that, um, you know, he was a big name and the draft board was worried that if they didn't make an example of him, then other people would would try to do the same, that more people might join the Nation of Islam just to try to get out of the draft. For Ali, it's interesting because you see his position sort of evolve over time. At first, he just says he doesn't want to go. You know, he, he says... If, if he just keeps boxing, he makes so much money and the government taxes it at such a high rate that they can use that tax money to, to buy more jets and more bombs and more tanks. So he's willing to contribute his da- tax dollars to the war effort. He just doesn't want to put his ass on the line. And then he starts saying, well, you know what? This is racist. You know, they're they're just picking on me because I'm black. And look at all the, the number of black people being drafted and dying over there. It's it's disproportionate. Why should I fight for a country that treats me like a second class citizen? I can't even go into a restaurant and order a hamburger. You know, why should I fight for a country that has those kind of principles? And then finally he begins to say, oh, you know what? I'm a conscientious objector. This is against my religion. And and it, it certainly looks like he um, was, you know, sort of fishing around to find the right the right answer. But, you know, the other way of looking at it is that, you know, we're human and we, we, we come to our decisions gradually. And he had, to, he had to think about it for a while before he made up his mind. But he was offered a deal by Lyndon Johnson or his representatives uh, to do what a number of boxers and ballplayers did during World War II and just, you know, perform exhibitions for the troops and stay off the front lines. But he rejected that as well, correct? Right. And I think that's really important to remember that um, he had a chance to compromise um, and he refused because he, whether he came to this decision slowly or not, when he came to it, when he settled on it, he was 100% committed and, and sincere. He would not accept a deal. He would not do anything that supported the military. And it's also important to remember that when he was convicted of draft evasion and sentenced to three and a half years in jail, he didn't know that he was going to ever box again. You know, we think about the fact that he lost three and a half years of his prime as a boxer, but he really didn't know that it was only going to be three and a half years. He had very good reason to believe that it might be permanent forever. And he was prepared to make that sacrifice. So with all that going on, he continued to fight for another year or so. The decision over George Chavallo, some pretty easy victories over Ernie Terrell, Cleveland Williams, and Zora Foley. So in your opinion, Jonathan, was this final year or so before he was stripped of the crown and forbidden to fight, Ali at his finest in the ring? I think it was. I think that last year before he um, is shut down, is the finest display of boxing that we've ever seen from Ali. And one might argue that it's the it's the greatest performance by a heavyweight boxer we've ever seen because he's fighting some tough guys and he's making it look easy. He's not getting hit very much. He's not a knockout puncher, so these fights sometimes go on a little while, but he's in total command. He's not getting hurt. 
He's got this incredible combination of speed and power that we've never really seen in the heavyweight ranks. He's a heavyweight version of Sugar Ray Robinson, and and it's it's a beautiful thing to watch, even if you consider the sport to be a little bit gruesome. Yeah, I mean, just from the perspective of a boxing fan, which I am, the timing of his exile was extremely unfortunate because just as he reached his peak, there were three or four really top-notch heavyweights bursting on the scene. You had Frazier, Foreman, uh, Ken Norton. I mean, even some of the second-tier guys like Oscar Bonavina were very tough. But talk about Ali's exile, Jonathan, and the toll that it took on him personally and financially. He was bored out of his mind. He was, you know, he never had to go to jail. So he had that going for him. While his case was on appeal, he was allowed to remain free, but he couldn't box. He missed the attention. He missed the um, the gym. He didn't really have incentive to stay in great shape. He was out trying to make some money to support his family. He also began cheating on his wife at the time. So, you know, his personal life was a mess. It would always be a mess. This was, um, I think, a really um, difficult time for him. It, in some ways, it raises his profile as a political figure. You know, he becomes a hero on college campuses. He becomes a hero of the growing anti-war movement. But that's not really what he wants to be. Um, in fact, you know, Elijah Muhammad is trying to encourage him to just forget about boxing and preach. But he can't do it. He needs he needs the juice. He needs the attention that, that only boxing can give him. And he certainly misses the money, too. I mean, at one point during that exile, he offered to work as Joe Frazier's sparring partner, right? That's right. Um, you know, he and Joe Frazier were really tight, which is also difficult to comprehend, given how badly Ali treated him over the years. But um, Frazier offered to lend him money, offered him a job. Uh, actually, Ali asked for a job as, as one of his sparring partners just so he could hang around and be in the gym. I think he needed the money, too. But um, mostly it just goes to show that he was you know, he really missed he missed the boxing world. So when he does finally get a chance to come back in the ring after three and a half years, it's a different world. And, and he's a different fighter. That's probably the most important thing uh, as far as he's concerned. He's He's really slowed, and uh, he's got to learn to fight differently after that. Now, another somewhat shocking discovery. Ali was caught by his wife with a prostitute hours before his first career loss, that first Frazier fight in 1971. And then he was caught with two prostitutes before the Norton loss two years later, in which he had his jaw broken. So that was certainly a day of ups and downs. But when you look at, when you look at that behavior, when you look, you know, at the way Ali would sign pretty much any contract put in front of him, when you look also at how he allowed his sparring partners to deliver headshot after headshot in the gym, which no other fighter would do, and which certainly contributed to his brain damage. I mean, these are all separate issues, but would you say that Muhammad Ali was a self-destructive man? Or was this just a case of poor impulse control and terrible judgment? Well, his wife, uh, Kalila, his second wife, said to me, you can explain it all in just one simple way. He was an idiot and he got that DNA wise. That was her line. Um, but I don't believe that. I mean, he, he well, he was obviously a, a genius in many ways, but he, he did have this certain naivete that suggested he could get away with whatever he wanted. He could eat as much as he wanted and not have to worry about putting on weight. He could sleep as, as late as he wanted. He could train as little as he wanted. He could engage with prostitutes right before a fight, and it was all going to somehow be okay. And whether you call that um, stupidity or or confidence. I don't know. There's a fine line, I guess. Now, as far as the brain damage, you included some analysis from CompuBox. That's a computerized scoring system that compiles uh, punches given and received. I mean, certainly, even before CompuBox, anyone could see how much punishment that he took in the ring. I mean, Ferdy Pacheco, the doctor working in Ali's corner, said he saw signs of brain damage after the first Frazier fight. Uh, but talk about what CompuBox uncovered and the factors of Ali's style that may have accelerated his progressive brain disease. Even a casual observer could tell that Ali was taking more punches after he came back and that he discovered that he had this other gift that he never really knew about before. And that was, he had a, an, an iron jaw. He, he could not be knocked out. He could just take punishment at extraordinary levels and stay on his feet. And that allowed him an advantage where he could tire opponents out and, and win fights in the late rounds. So I thought it would be interesting to see if we could show some patterns. So I worked with CompuBox. We counted every punch from every fight. There are a few fights that we couldn't find complete film for, but for the, but almost all of Ali's fights, we were able to watch every round and count every punch that he threw, every punch that he was hit with, 
And you can see these very clear patterns that in the first third of his career, he's dramatically out punching his opponents. In the middle phase of his career, it starts to shift and it's, it's neck and neck. He's taking a lot more punishment. In the third portion of his career, he is dramatically taking more damage than he's than he's giving, and he's only winning these fights by exhausting his opponents. and And the toll that it's being done to him is extraordinary. He's I, I calculated that he probably was hit about two hundred thousand times if you include all of his sparring sessions, his exhibitions, amateur fights. And that's just an enormous, uh, unthinkable amount of of damage that you're doing to your skull when you when you take on to your brain when you take on that kind of punishment. So two hundred thousand headshots. Yeah, well, 200,000 punches. We can't be sure how many of them were, were to the head, but some, a lot. Yeah. Now, some other statistical analysis from your book that I found both fascinating and disturbing was by some speech scientists who studied Ali's interviews and public statements over the years, and they discovered that in 1967, he spoke at a rate of 4.07 syllables per second. That's close to average. But by 1971, that had fallen to 3.8 and would continue to slide for the rest of his life. His ability to clearly articulate words also declined. Now, this is an old story. I mean, 100 years ago, they called it punch drunk. Today, it's called CTE. Uh, There's no getting around the fact that boxers are going to experience this on some level. So having done this research and written this book, do you think boxing should be banned or, you know, given the fact that it's consensual and we all know the risks? by now, or we should, should it be allowed to continue? What's your take on that whole controversy? I hate to say it because a lot of boxing fans are going to be uh, you know, angry with me, but I think they ought to stop it. I think it's it, there's, there's no justification for when you know you're doing that kind of damage. Yes, it's consensual, but you know, not wearing a seatbelt used to be consensual too. And I think that um, we shouldn't give people more opportunities to hurt themselves knowing the, the, the consequences as clearly as we do. All right. Now, there's one final conspiracy theory that I have to ask about. At the fight in Zaire in 74, where Ali regained the championship by knocking out George Foreman in the eighth round. Foreman said years later that he had been drugged before the fight by his own trainer, Dick Sadler, that he was absolutely sure of it. I mean, his legs do look wobbly pretty early in that fight. And by the fourth round or so, his punches do appear unusually weak. And that's actually noted by Bob Sheridan, the TV commentator. And Foreman normally had, you know, Mike Tyson level power. But what's your take on that controversy, Jonathan? And were you able to talk to Foreman himself about that? I did talk to Foreman about it. And I was stunned because I had read in his autobiography uh, these theories, that this, this um, speculation that you know, he believed he'd been drugged. And um, when I asked him about it, he said, I don't believe it. I know it. I know I was drugged. This is, you know, 50 years later, almost 50 years later, and, and he's still 100% certain. And you know, he knows that it doesn't sound good. He knows people think are going to think that he's, he's being a crybaby about it. But the longer I talked to him, the more I could see this was really eating at him. He, he was still really burned up about it. And um, I'm not very susceptible to conspiracy theories, but there could be something there. It, it also could just be that he was dehydrated and he was um, he later learned that he, you know, he hadn't been drinking enough water. But you know, Sadler then, you know, the next year goes to work for Ali. So maybe, maybe Ali owed him one. Yeah, the thing with Foreman, in all the interviews I've ever seen with him, including in that famous documentary, Champions Forever, he's incredibly generous with praise. He's also very humble, and he just seems honest to me. So I don't know, that, that accusation to me does carry some weight. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that you see when you interview these old timers is that they start out really magnanimous and they love Ali and they praise him and they know that you know he's a global icon and that it, but the longer you talk to him and especially if you get a couple drinks in them you realize that they're still competitors that they're still angry that they lost which is as as it should be these are these men are warriors and when they start to get a little more honest um you hear that they're still angry they're still carrying a grudge that they 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 wanted to beat this man absolutely and and a few of them did but final question jonathan and you've been incredibly generous with your time what surprised you the most in what you uncovered and how would you assess ali's ultimate legacy wow um i think i was most surprised that deep underneath this massive ego and this um, narcissistic personality um, some kind of humility remained. You know, I, some people tell me when they read the book that they think he's got a lot of uh, similarities with with our president, uh, with, with Trump. Certainly, they're both narcissists. But um, yeah, they also both tag their opponents with nicknames. 
Yeah, nicknames, um, womanizing. There's a, there are some things there. But the big difference for me and the thing that always redeemed Ali was that he loved people and he loved making people happy. Sometimes that got him in trouble because he, he had to make every woman who crossed his path happy. But until the very end, he would just go out of his way to try to make people happy, to warm their spirits. You know, if somebody came up to him for an autograph, he would have a, a real conversation. He would he would invite them to, to come along for dinner. He just, it was genuine and it was there all the time. And I think that um, the fact that, that he retained that kind of humility, even as he became, you know, the greatest egotist of his day, um, that was a, one of the, the pleasant surprises for me. As for his legacy, um, I think in a way he was he, he was almost like a prophet. You know, he he saw the world in, in such simple terms. He just he, he was very good at at seeing the best in, in the world and um, standing up for what he believed in all the time. You know, it's he knew who he was and he never tried to fake it. And that kind of sincerity, along with, you know, sticking to your principles, I think that's how he changed the world. And, and you know, he, he will be remembered for not his boxing, but for standing up to power, for refusing to go along with racist ways, for refusing to endorse a war that he didn't believe in. So, you know, I think he'll be remembered as one of the great rebels in American history. The book is called Ali, A Life, and you should all pick it up. It's not only an important story about a complex and hugely influential figure, but it's honest, it's entertaining. I couldn't put it down with tons of fascinating stories and subplots that we didn't even get to today and some amazing pictures as well. But Jonathan, thanks so much for taking the time. We really do appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. I enjoyed talking to you. All right, we'll come back. More Gotham Variety in just a moment. Your feedback is important to us on Twitter, at Gotham Variety, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, joe at gothamvariety.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and get exclusive access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash Gotham Variety and subscribe. As always, I welcome your feedback, so if you have any questions or comments on today's episode or anything else, please contact me via email, joe at gothamvariety.com. I would love to hear your thoughts. Check us out and subscribe on Apple, Stitcher, or Spotify so you don't miss a single episode. Next week, I'll be reviewing Terrence Malick's latest film, A Hidden Life. But until then, thanks so much for joining us. Take care, and just remember, in regards to this whole coronavirus, prudence not panic. We will not be defeated by this. I promise you that. See you soon.